and then stop screen sharing and you're live. And I will turn off my camera. Well, good evening. After navigating some technical issues here, uh, we are very glad to welcome you to the James Monroe Museum's online presentation. I'm Scott Harris, Executive Director of Museums at the University of Mary Washington. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the program entitled uh, The Virginia Dynasty, Four Presidents and the Creation of the American Nation. This is the book by Dr. Lynn Cheney that we'll be discussing this evening. James Row Museum is the nation's largest repository of artifacts and archives related to the fifth president of the United States, who was the fourth and last member of the Virginia dynasty. It should therefore come as no surprise that while we will be talking with Dr. Cheney about all the presidents in this group, we may tip the scale once in a while a little bit toward James Monroe. Before I introduce our guest, I wanna thank the sponsors who make the uh, programs presented annually by the James Monroe Museum possible. These include the Fredericksburg uh, Savings Charitable Trust, the Paul and Jane Jones Trust, which is administered by trustee Walter Sheffield, the Stuart Jones Charitable Trust, and the Friends of the James Monroe Museum. We greatly appreciate their support. I remind our audience on Facebook Live that you may post questions to Dr. Cheney throughout the conversation in the comments section on the right-hand side of your screen. Our public programs coordinator, Lindsay Crawford, who is administering the live broadcast, will collate these and pass them on to me so that I may address them to Dr. Cheney. Um, we do uh, promise to get to as many uh, as we can in the time we have available. So we would encourage people to be as on topic as possible with your questions and to be as succinct as possible. And now to introduce our special guest. Lynn Cheney has loved history for as long as she can remember, and she has spent much of her professional life writing and speaking about the importance of knowing history and teaching it well. She earned her Bachelor of Arts degree with highest honors from Colorado College, her Master of Arts from the University of Colorado, and her PhD with a specialization in 19th century British literature from the University of Wisconsin. She is the recipient of awards and honorary degrees from numerous colleges and universities. And she chaired the National Endowment for the Humanities from 1986 to 1993. She was second lady of the United States from 2001 to 2009 during her husband, Dick Cheney's tenure as vice president in the administration of George W. Bush. She's currently a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Dr. Cheney is the author of the best-selling James Madison, A Life Reconsidered, and has also written six best-selling history books for children, along with numerous other publications. Uh, I should note here that her latest book that we will discuss this evening, The Virginia Dynasty, uh, is available for purchase from the James Monroe Museum's online store, a link to which will appear periodically in the comments section uh, of this broadcast. We would also invite you to come and purchase it in person starting March 15th when the James Monroe Museum and our other UMW museums reopen. But Dr. Cheney, welcome to our broadcast. Thank you for being with us this evening. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, we are on the eve of the traditional uh, inaugural day, March 4th, um, uh, which for many years, including for the Virginia dynasty presidents was the day that they would look forward to. And uh, I think it's fitting that we're on the eve of that from a historical standpoint. Um, the Virginia dynasty, of course, is the term that's applied to four of our first five presidents, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and of course, James Monroe. And all of them have been the subject of many uh, biographies and specific studies of history and politics. What led you to do this collective biography of them and, and at this time? I was uh, struck when I was researching and writing my book on James Madison by how interconnected his life and his uh, political career was with Washington, uh, with Jefferson and with Monroe. And it, I kept seeing the connections and it struck me as interesting enough to become a whole book in part because um, the story is not what everyone thinks it is. The story isn't a brave band of brothers who uh, acted together to create the American nation. 
They did indeed create the American nation, but often through quarrels and disagreements and uh, sometimes the end of, of friendship. So it, it, it's an interesting human story that also takes, uh, takes the reader through perhaps the most significant period of American history. And what I found fascinating both in the study of this period within my own career, but also particularly reading your book is that there is a constant interweaving of these relationships, um, certainly between these four and all the other people with whom they were interacting. Exactly. I mean, one of the surprises to me was um, how the latter members, the last three members of the Virginia dynasty, all became estranged from George Washington. Um, we think of George Washington as this charismatic, heroic figure, which indeed he was, but he didn't have many friends. And he kept trying to make friends with whom he could, quote, live in confidence but uh, never really succeeded and um, managed to alienate um, the latter three members of the dynasty with, of course, some help on their side in the estrangement. I, I think in, in our case, again, being focused on the, the interpretation of James Monroe's career, it's particularly striking. He was the youngest um, of the four and so separated furthest in age from Washington. And it would be probably going too far to say there was a, a, a father-son type of thing there, but, the, but there was something of that, a generational uh, relationship that did start out very much the younger man greatly admiring the older and benefiting from his uh, uh, approbation, uh, choosing him for an important mission uh, to go uh, before the rest of the army at Trenton. But as, as they both matured in their political activity, and in Monroe particularly, as he became a much more uh, strident um, Democratic Republican, uh, it, it seemed to show the fault lines uh, of that relationship. And um, I think there was regret, probably. I don't know if you found that in your writing, that these, these, these political differences got in the way of what was genuine, I think, regard for each other. But I don't well, know. I'm not sure how much uh, regard Washington had over the long term for for Monroe, he, he did write him a very nice letter of recommendation, but it was Monroe's feeling that he had been seriously overlooked after his, um, his bravery at the Battle of Trenton where he was uh, nearly killed and uh, took months to recover. And then when he went back to the army, there was no place for him. He was an officer and there were just not enough soldiers for the number of people who wanted to be officers. This seemed to have been a great blow to his ego. He had a very fragile ego. And I'm not sure he ever recovered his uh, respect for Washington after that. He um, then was taken under wing by Thomas Jefferson. And that's probably the most uh, fatherly son uh, relationship. In the end though, Monroe managed to alienate Jefferson. So it was, it, it was, uh, a contentious time and probably nobody made Washington more angry than Monroe did uh, when he wrote a book criticizing Washington after Washington had recalled him. Uh, he wrote a book and Washington knew this was happening and he was very anxious to see a copy. He kept writing former aides to say, have you seen one? He finally got his hands on one and one of the most interesting historical documents and you can see it online Mm -hmm. is Washington's uh, marginal notes on, uh, on Monroe's uh, critique of him. If he was, Washington was really angry, as yeah. was Monroe at him. Yeah, yes, I mean, there, there was, uh, again, the, 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 the relationship certainly was, was greatly influenced by the politics of the Federalists and the Republicans as it was emerging, our, our attitudes toward France and Great Britain. And... Um, you're right, Monroe came back from France ready to tell his side of it and Washington uh, remarkably, as you say, was making the liner notes and sort of refuting point by point, uh, literally toward his deathbed uh, practically. And um, exactly the last words really he spoke about Monroe were, were with asperity as his secretary uh, recorded, hearing that Monroe was becoming governor of Virginia. So it's- And that Madison was praising him in the newspaper. So right. the the combination of the two was uh, 
I don't know. I think it probably added additional stress upon a man who was uh, ill, but certainly not enough to have uh, resulted in his sad end. Interestingly, too, and you may have seen this in your research, a lot of what Monroe undertook in his presidency, consciously or unconsciously, was echoing Washington. And uh, I think that there's 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 certainly some areas you can point to, including foreign policy, where he seemed to be following a lot of that lead. Well, one of the uh, areas that interested me, I didn't write about it much in the book, but um, when Washington became president, he did national tours you know, going around the country, people were so thrilled. I mean, most hadn't even seen a picture of Washington, uh, you know, much less the man in the flesh. And these were enormously successful um, events. Monroe did the same thing. He took a page from uh, Washington's notebook and did these very, very uh, enthusiastically received tours around the United States. He, he, you know, they'd go, he'd go for six months you know, to do one of these tours. Presidency then wasn't quite what it is now. No, so and challenging. he was bringing the presidency to the people in a way that didn't often occur at that point. Um, oh, and the people were so excited. This one description I read was of a bridge, you know, and they had constructed hoops across the bridge that they decorated. And at both ends of the bridge, they had tethered live eagles, you know, to add to the excitement of it. Doesn't sound very nice to eagles, but uh, it, that's uh, what they did out of their enthusiasm for uh, Monroe. That first tour of the New England states in 1817, in fact, gave rise to the term era of good feelings. Uh, that was a newspaper man, wasn't it, who uh, wrote that? It, uh, You know, in some ways it was. I know it's the fashion now to point out all the conflict that uh, went on during his eight years in office. But in many ways, it was the air of good feeling. Um, Monroe um, managed to win uh, his first run at office, or was it his second? You help me. Um, with every electoral vote but one. It, it was his reelection. Yes, you're right. Um, and, uh, you know, Was Washington is the only one who ever beat that record. So part of it was, of course, that the Federalist Party uh, was in decay and decline. And so there was no uh, partisan element. It was just you know, different opinions of different things. Um, you, you, we touched a bit, obviously, on the Washington and Monroe relationship and the Jefferson. Um, perhaps to expand that, what were you struck by in the Washington-Madison, excuse me, the Jefferson-Madison-Monroe relationship? Uh, and, and how that influenced the lives of all three. Well, Jefferson uh, really uh, wanted to help Monroe. And of course, Monroe wanted Jefferson to help him. Um, Jefferson totally understood who Monroe was. He uh, said at one point uh, in a letter to Madison that uh, Monroe has a very high regard, you know, for his uh, honor and, uh, and his legacy. And uh, Madison too understood what was happening here because after Monroe um, ran against him for Congress, um, Madison described to Jefferson that, you know, they'd made it up. Friendship conquered all. Mm -hmm. And he added in this kind of snide little note, Madison did, at least on one side, I'm sure that's the case. <laughs> Implying of course that, uh, that Monroe uh, was not easily assuaged. No, and um, I think that it, it says something both to the, the depth of their professional relationship and their personal that they could feel very strongly uh, the, the interplay of, of the different political cycles they went through. And sometimes uh, I think Monroe felt that there was a, a, a bit of gamesmanship of being ganged up on a little bit with Jefferson and Madison. Uh, and then he would he would react uh, uh, with that, that uh, uh, high degree of pride that, that we've, we've seen throughout his writings and his relationships. He did not attend the Constitutional Convention and he blamed Madison as well as Edmund Randolph for keeping him out of it. Um, he was a little, I mean, I don't think they did. He was uh, very young. He was not in uh, uh, the House of Delegates when uh, the, the uh, uh, appointees were made to the convention. You know, I don't think they made a point out of keeping him out, but he certainly did. 
he um, he took umbrage uh, pretty easily. And I think one result was that he voted against ratifying the Constitution. Um, you know, later became an advocate, but no, we don't want this Constitution. And I didn't tell Bright. He didn't say that, of course, but that's sure what it seems. And then, of course, after that, he not only ran uh, against Madison for Congress and lost soundly, um, and he had help from Patrick Henry. That's interesting how Patrick Henry gets involved. But he also ran against Madison for president in 1808, which uh, was a very quixotic mission. You, you know, you just had the feeling it was something done by an angry man and not something done by a person who really hoped to be president. I, I think there was a message being sent. Uh, again, you've got a sense of Monroe coming back from a diplomatic mission. Yes, which he wasn't fully second supported. time. And um, you know, Patrick Henry's involvement the first time around with the uh, the uh, congressional race was some of the old Republican uh, guard trying to uh, assert its power and and perhaps use Monroe uh, a bit in that. Um, he he was always anxious to make the mark, certainly. Yes. Um, he did not come from the depth of resources that some of his uh, companions did. And I think that that put a certain, I don't know if chip on the shoulder is the right way of saying it, but certainly an ambition uh, yes. that was there. And, and uh, they were all ambitious, of course, really ambitious, but he hit it less well than the three others. <laughs> um, slavery, of course, was a factor in the personal lives of all four of the Virginia dynasty uh, presidents in, in uh, their personal economy and on to varying degrees in their public careers. And, you know, we could spend an entire program just on that topic. Um, but I do wonder broadly, how do you assess these presidents' commitments to the ideals of liberty and equality while they were personally holding black persons in bondage and in some cases pursuing policies that perpetuated slavery? Well, I, I do believe there was a sincere commitment to uh, enlightenment ideals of uh, freedom and justice and liberty. They were in a place and in a time where they had an opportunity to build a nation that was uh, founded on those ideals. At the same time, there was this disjunction in their lives, as you point out, their uh, lives were built on slavery. They all held slaves. It's, it's an interesting contradiction. And I've said to myself, you know, they could have said, okay, I'm not going to live in this contradiction anymore. I'll just get out of the independence game and the liberty game. But they didn't. They couldn't get out of the slavery issue. They couldn't figure out a way to emancipate all slaves, which of course was the proper thing to do. And so they just sort of put that part of their life on hold. And thankfully for all of us, they helped establish, had a large part in establishing uh, this nation built on ideals that were in the end, absolutely deadly to slavery. You know, you can't found a nation on liberty and freedom and justice and, and equality. Um, without having those notions underscore in uh, the brightest, boldest quill pen you can imagine how um, much you're living in contradiction. I think it's Gordon Wood who said, you know, it was a, an interesting decision they made to go ahead and uh, pursue Enlightenment ideals, but I'm sure glad they did. And Monroe, of course, was involved in an enterprise that from hindsight and even during its time was viewed uh, uh, as also problematic in many ways, the American Colonization Society. Um, I wouldn't say that he was a leader of it, but he was literally present in the room where it was created. He lent a degree of support to it and in return got the capital of what would become the nation of Liberia named after him. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a, a legacy that's bound up in some contradictions too, isn't it? Because it's not necessarily helping those that were enslaved, it was getting the freed African-Americans out of the picture to a degree. That's true, but uh, Monroe and Madison uh, both viewed it as, how shall I say, a spur to emancipation. 
One of the difficulties with a, a, a person in Virginia trying to free his slaves or her, well, his, um, would be, um, was that there are many requirements. And one was that you had to uh, see to it that the slave moved out of Virginia. Now, uh, and provide for his well-being in wherever he moved to, because Illinois certainly didn't want you to send someone who was impoverished um, to their state without your helping in some way. So the whole idea of emancipation was troubled by the fact that uh, if you free your slaves, then what is the next step? Well, as Monroe and Madison saw it, one step would be to provide a method for um, people, uh, 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 people who had been enslaved um, to travel to uh, what became Liberia. Nobody went uh, who wasn't uh, willing to go. It wasn't as though they packed up freed slaves and no matter their opinions and sent them there. But they both believed that what they were doing was, uh, you know, as I say, a spur to emancipation. It gradually um, it became uh, the belief among abolitionists that the whole thing was kind of a shadow game. And it was uh, being attempted in order to uh, make slavery less onerous. You know, we got this thing going called the American Colonization Society. So, you know, we're trying. And it's, it, that's why it fell um, into disrepute. Um, Madison once said, toward the end of his life, that if it weren't for his activities and for the existence of the American Colonization Society, he would be um, so full of despair that his life would be worthless. So, you know, it had a very interesting career uh, in its uh, approval. In the beginning, yes, but not long after it began, as you noted, it fell into, uh, became victim to, not victim, it became subject to great criticism. And, and yet even Lincoln was willing to entertain the notion, to, to, to put it out, uh, out for conversation. But Yes, and you know, the other thing about Lincoln that's interesting is, uh, you know, he didn't have a, a, a great uh, enthusiasm for Jefferson. He uh, had read the book, there was a book written uh, early on that talked about the Sally Hemings affair. Mm -hmm. And that did it for Lincoln, you know, he just, that was it. But he managed, even though he had this kind of personal animus against Jefferson, to admire what he had done in putting the concepts of liberty and equality and justice in the Declaration of Independence. As Lincoln saw it, and Frederick Douglass too, having those ideas there, was indeed um, the uh, weapon that uh, slavery could not survive. Indeed. Um, passing on some of the other questions that are coming through here now, I wanted to uh, see if you encountered any surprises as you researched and wrote your book, um, either new information that maybe challenged an old assumption or some new insight to the characters of these men that you hadn't suspected before. Well, I hadn't suspected that Washington was so lonely, you know, that he, he would reach out and try to have friends and it never worked. I think he finally found his confidant in uh, uh, Elizabeth Powell, um, a great belle of the time, uh, an intelligent and sympathetic woman. And he seems to have been very close to her. Uh, but, but that was a surprise. It was also a surprise to see how Monroe, like Washington, had a really a uh, strong temper. And like Washington, he tried to control it. And Monroe's method, which just makes me smile because not a bad method at all, was to sit down and write out all of his angry thoughts. You know, to, to say that Washington was a poseur, that uh, he wasn't really uh, resigning his commission uh, from the army because he thought it was the right thing to do. He thought it would be good for his image. Mm -hmm. um, and th this is not an idea that uh, has been ignored in modern scholarship. Many people have written about it, but the animosity with which Monroe wrote about it is just stunning. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a surprise to think of him as uh, being that angry with uh, Washington. And, so and that, go ahead, please. 
Well, no, I was going to say, you're right. And, and again, I think it speaks something to how, how strongly the relationship began for them and how much I think they wanted to have invested in it. Even after their estrangement, Washington was uh, upset that Monroe didn't visit him when he was coming to Alexandria. Um, I think he still hoped that there would be some kind of interaction, even after all that had occurred between them. Um, but it kind of depends on how you read that particular passage in Washington's letters. He said something like, Mr. Monroe did not bother to stop and see me on his way home. And, and I took it as kind of uh, sarcastic. You know, he knew Monroe was mad. He didn't really expect Monroe to come, but he wanted to have it known that he had noticed Monroe hadn't come. I, you know, it's, that's what's fascinating about history in one single sentence like that. Um, you can find so much to think about and to uh, mull over. Um, to go back to Monroe for a minute, though, I uh, I was impressed, and I, you know, I just didn't know much about Monroe. I have to confess, um, it, with with the great ambition he had to be a great warrior. Um, from the beginning, uh, when he was, you know, raiding the armory. Um, at Williamsburg to uh, give weapons to uh, the Patriots. From then until you know the end, when he is still out there riding on horseback, doing scouting during the War of 1812, that that theme is uh, is so strong. I also was uh, impressed with how much a family man he is was. Um, he took as much of his family as he could everywhere. That's true. And, and it was expensive. Um, uh, pe other people didn't do it. I mean, you know, they might take the wife along for a while, but uh, no, not, not the whole family. And so his daughters grew up to be very sophisticated. Um, they spoke French uh, fluently because they had spent so much time in France. Monroe himself was the best traveled uh, of all the members of the dynasty. You know, he had spent so much time in Europe by the time he became a high official in the government. Nobody else had that kind of experience. We, we uh, uh, have noted that, not surprisingly, in, in our interpretation of Monroe, and that really um, uh, no president came into the office with more public service roles having already been on his uh, resume than uh, uh, the Monroe. The closest runner up, and it's a great one, is George H.W. Bush and the number of different jobs he had. <laughs> well, I didn't know that. That's so interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, you know, Revolutionary War soldier, the, the uh, Fredericksburg Common Councils are always proud to say here in Fredericksburg. <laughs> um, the uh, Virginia General Assembly, Governor of Virginia, the Senate, uh, his diplomatic postings, uh, Secretary of War, and as you know, Secretary of State uh, combined for a while. Uh, and then the presidency. So um, we, uh, we, we've, we say he's the hardest working president in show business sometimes. Oh, that's interesting. A good way to look at it. That's, that's uh, and I think that's another part of his uh, legacy that uh, hasn't been noted as much as it should have, but I am convinced will be more and more noted uh, now, now that his letters are published. That will make such a difference, I think. Yes, and we're, we're very proud that the, the papers of James Monroe was another one of our initiatives at the University of Mary Washington, and we're, mm -hmm. we're now, uh, volume eight is under uh, uh, work right now and is really getting into the presidential years. So we're ah. now on the, the last three volumes of the papers that we've projected, uh, some of the most consequential uh, of the material. Um, but you're right, I couldn't help but think when you mentioned about him writing out the letter, there is that, there are several, but one in particular, un, unmailed letter to Washington, that is the one you're probably referring to, that he lets it all hang out. And, well, and you know, it's a good way of controlling your temper. You know, sit down and say everything nasty and bad that you're thinking, and then don't mail the letter. Pretty, Which again pretty was a Lincoln thing too. Pardon? Lincoln did that as well. He was famous for writing out or advising, write out everything you want to say and then tear it up. Well, one of the questions I've had, I don't know what this, what was um, Lincoln's, um, how he intended his letters to be saved or, or bestowed or whatever, but Monroe apparently wanted the letters to be saved in his papers. And it has always occurred to me that if I had that method of getting rid of my, uh, uh, avoiding a temperamental outburst, 
I'd tear the letter up. And it, so did, did he want us to know that he had this anger? Did he forget? Um, was he just too busy? Couldn't he afford to spend the time or have the time editing his letters that Madison did? It's another one of those questions that, uh, you know, his, history brings to you and doesn't answer. It does. Um, Monroe did undertake his autobiography fairly late in life, but didn't get very far to our, our lasting regret. And Mrs. Monroe wanted all of her correspondence burned, which is why we have so little uh, available to us. And it certainly mm -hmm. compares to the other first ladies. Well, I've always thought that uh, an interesting, well, not just Mrs. Monroe, but compare Mrs. Monroe to Abigail Adams. You know, there are thousands of letters that uh, nobody in the Adams family ever thought of getting rid of. Maybe it was a more Southern genteel thing that you didn't want to uh, save your letters. Mrs. Washington didn't want her letters saved either. And uh, we have only a few because uh, she misplaced some of them and they were later found. So th this idea of women, you know, not wanting their uh, personal feelings, uh, political feelings known is an interesting one. Now, you, you were obviously concentrating on the presidents in the Virginia dynasty, but as we've just made a few references, the, the wives of the women in their lives certainly played a large role as well. Had, had you thought about putting more in there about them, or are you thinking maybe is there a subject of its own perhaps uh, to look at, the, the, the think, wives I, of the know, dynasty? I, I did, that was a hard balance. That was a hard uh, uh, decision to make about how much to put in. So I did keep them, uh, you know, not as important to the book as their husbands were. Sadly, sadly, uh, they were not as important to history as their husbands were. Um, it's a, you know, a time when Abigail Adams, for example, can talk about the importance of remembering the ladies, but she had no power to, uh, to do anything about it. So yes, they, they do play secondary roles. I'm sorry that history has uh, sort of designated them for that, but uh, that's how it is. How long did it take you to, to put this book together from, from, from idea to publication? Well, we're gonna go clear back to idea. It's probably six years. Mm. But I think taking a five years, that's probably a little unreasonable. But five years isn't an unreasonable amount of time to spend on a, a big book uh, like this. And plus it was hard. You know, it's not as though you can start with one person and tell the story of that person's life um, and do it all chronologically. You have, you have four actors and more actually, but they're intertwined and working out how to uh, demonstrate that and enlighten the reader, amuse the reader sometimes with the uh, way they were intertwined. And at the same time, make chronological sense of the story you're telling is a challenge. So I think, I don't know what I'm writing next, but uh, I think I'm gonna do a single figure. I was, that was gonna be something I was gonna uh, see if we could get a scoop on here as to whether or not uh, you had an idea what your next work would be. But. Well, you know, I'm kind of in the exploratory stage. The last thing you want to do is pick a subject and find yourself two years in not liking him or her very much. I think that would be hard. Um, but also not thinking there was the kind of significance you wanted here, not thinking that this was a story that uh, readers would, uh, would be fascinated by. So you got to be very careful before you pick your subject. Was there any uh, uh, information or something you really wanted to, to find to, to uh, help write this book that you had trouble locating? Was there, was there a question you wanted to answer about any of them uh, that, that eluded you or were you able to pretty much mine what you wanted? Well, uh, two, two points. One is I've had wonderful research assistants. I have one at a time. I don't mean to suggest I've got a library full really wonderful um, people that uh, uh, work for AEI and uh, American Enterprise Institute and, and help me. And they, I tell you, they have run down rabbit holes for me that I never thought they'd succeed to getting to the bottom of. But I can't remember the answer to this question, but I don't even know if most people know it's a question. Where was um, the Louisiana Treaty signed? 
Now, I had a research assistant that actually found out the exact building in Paris where that happened. And uh, I'd never read it before. When I asked her, I didn't think she'd find out, but she did. So that's one part of it. Secondly, there is so much on the internet now. It's truly amazing. You can, I'm, I'm constantly stunned by how much is there and um, makes research a whole lot easier. Uh, but it also makes for fewer mysteries, I guess, since there, there's so much out there that uh, you have access to. So what, is there a principal message that you would like readers of the Virginia dynasty to take away uh, from, from the experience of reading it? Uh, the great contribution that uh, these four men made to uh, creating our nation. It's, uh, as I point out in the introduction, you know, among the four of them, they doubled the size of the United States. They extended the border across to the uh, Pacific Ocean. Uh, one after another, you can uh, find these examples uh, where they wrote the Declaration of Independence, for example. They were the major um, architect of the Constitution. The contributions they made, and I do worry now that one, uh, we're not as mindful of those contributions as we were. And in fact, you know, we're, there is a section of people who uh, don't want these men respected. Um, and that, that is distressing to me. When a statue of Washington comes down, I am distressed. Um, but I think the best way to uh, sort of push back on that is, uh, to tell the real story, to tell how much they contributed. Well, and we find certainly with Monroe, one of the most enduring, perhaps the most enduring legacy of his era and his presidency is the Monroe Doctrine, um, which is, again, we could do a whole program and we've done whole programs on the Monroe Doctrine, mm -hmm. the, the impact that it had throughout the 19th, 20th, and now even into the 21st centuries, there are echoes of that. And there are opinions across the scale as to what it represents in terms of America's role in supporting democracy and self-determination and in also establishing hegemony within the hemisphere. And, and I, we, we don't take a side clearly at the museum, but we do marvel that this statement from 1823 can still inspire conversation and still has relevance. And um, I think that, again, you're not talking so much about celebrating necessarily, but certainly acknowledging and, and, and learning from. Well, and finding out these interesting details, um, one of which is how much John Quincy Adams was responsible for the Monroe Doctrine. He was Monroe's Secretary of State at the time. And he was a perfect Secretary of State in that he you know, wove these ideas uh, into Monroe's thinking and into the uh, message about um, uh, South America and Europe. And he never told anybody, you know, he never said, oh, look at me, I'm so smart. I got the president to do this and that. The one thing he did want to make sure uh, was part of his legacy is he loved the Adams Onus Treaty. Now, can you imagine that he would rather have been um, remembered for the Adams Onus Treaty <laughs> than for the Monroe Doctrine? But there you go. Monroe um, mellowed. And in the beginning, he, uh, and in the beginning, in the middle, he was so anxious to have his ego fed um, by making sure that everyone acknowledged what he had done. By the time he became president, he was much more relaxed. There is a story that uh, John Quincy Adams tells in his diary, maybe it's his diary, mm -hmm. about uh, how the president would be critical of his ideas. And so uh, Adams would put more ideas, um, many of which he had no uh, great uh, interest in, more ideas in the memos he sent the president so that the president would focus on those instead of on the uh, ones that John Quincy Adams really valued. So Quincy Adams was a very prickly character. And it is so interesting that uh, he and Monroe um, worked so well together um, to accomplish great things. Indeed, probably one of the most moving eulogies of James Monroe was the one delivered by John Quincy Adams 
um, exactly. which is uh, uh, a, a real tribute, an incredibly long tribute to his career, <laughs> but it ends really strong. Uh, and and uh, I must say that um, given that even going back to John Adams, Monroe's relationship with John Adams at one point came to the point of pondering a duel uh, again in the wake of coming back from France uh, and that 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 recall of the mission. Uh, we we we've talked about Monroe having almost fought a duel with Hamilton over the Mariah Reynolds affair and the revealing of documents, but the criticism after his diplomatic mission led him to contemplate with John John Adams, who he finally decided not to take on, fortunately for everybody. But that relationship was repaired, and I think in large part, uh, certainly uh, picking John Quincy as the Secretary of State to help heal whatever breach there might have been. But they were a very effective working team, Quincy Adams and Monroe. Uh, one of the sad uh, breakups, so to speak, was between Jefferson and Monroe. At uh, at the end, well, Jefferson was retired. Monroe uh, was still in office, and Jefferson had a, a patronage job that he wanted to go to a certain friend, and he even promised the friend uh, who had helped Jefferson a lot over the years. He promised the friend that he would get him the job from Monroe, but Monroe had other ideas. You know, he had his own candidate. And I do believe there was a little streak of righteousness there where he was saying, no, presidents do this. Presidents don't appoint people uh, because someone else told them to appoint him. And that, that led to the final and complete break. So sad. You know, one of the most moving parts of a book like this are how these men express their lifelong friendship as, uh, as the end came. Wonderful letters between Madison and Monroe, wonderful letters between Madison and Jefferson, but nothing between Monroe and Jefferson. And that, that's a sad thing after he had uh, uh, been Jefferson's protege for so many years. It's true. And, and, and much earlier in the relationship, there was a very close association, and um, uh, particularly when they were neighbors uh, in Albemarle County, and um, then it, it did change. Um, actually, making reference to Virginia, one of our audience questions, what, what do you believe it was about Virginia that created the conditions uh, for so many of, of its native sons to become president and to have this influence in this era? Well, you know, the, the Virginians uh, in the beginning uh, represented the, the royalist side of um, English politics. And, you know, they were determined to uh, have their children well-educated. Uh, they were determined to live themselves in what they thought were gracious ways, such as the British would approve of. And all of those aspirations made education itself very important. It was at that same time, and they were looking for teachers. It was really hard to find teachers out here in the Virginia wilderness. And about the same time, um, many uh, students of the Scottish Enlightenment who had advanced degrees became interested in finding jobs in North America and Virginia was the place that they migrated to. Wonderful teachers. Uh, Washington, of course, was self-educated, but the other three experienced wonderful teachers. And uh, I, do, I do think that's an important part of uh, what made their contributions possible. I, I agree. And uh, certainly uh, Massachusetts had a great uh, tradition of learning too. And we didn't quite get the Massachusetts dynasty in the way that we got the Virginia dynasty. But um, I, uh, I, I think it is a fascinating phenomenon. And, and actually, I've only found one other book that was published back in 1965 on the dynasty. I, I was... Hmm struck by the fact that, that uh, you, you really have given us something here uh, in, in examining the four of them together and trying to look at the interrelationships that we really didn't have before. Um, well, that's nice. I didn't, I didn't think of it that way, but uh, I appreciate your, your compliment. Thank you. Well, um, I, I do believe that uh, for most students of history, certainly of my generation, Virginia dynasty is like some of these other terms that you get a few minutes of it in fourth grade and then you don't necessarily come back to it. In my case, I did. But um, I, I, I think that because we have this, uh, we have an opportunity for people to have a better sense of what these 
Department's uh, contributions were. I, I do want to ask, this is one that came in here, um, if you could pose a direct question to any of the Virginia Dynasty presidents, whom would you choose and what would you ask? Well, I don't know if there's a question I would ask. I would just be so interested in, uh, I am interested, fascinated by thinking, what would they think of our world today? What would they notice most? And probably, I, this might not be uh, widely agreed to, I think it's technology. You know, I think they would be stunned to see planes flying across the sky, stunned at the idea that we have a rover on Mars, uh, stunned at the idea that you and I can talk to so many people through a couple of machines and not very big machines either. <laughs> so I think it's technology. When I think, though, whom I would like to have lunch with, that's the question I ask myself, I find it hard not to pick Jefferson. So fascinating, a polymath. He, you know, he tried he had in, in everything. And apparently he was pretty polite to women. Uh, he visited, oh my gosh, uh, the wife of the National Intelligencer, Margaret Bayard Smith. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Right after he became uh, president, she had no idea. You know, he was such a pleasant man sitting in her parlor waiting to talk to her husband. So Somehow, I don't think Washington was be as congenial, but I think, oh, wouldn't you love to see Washington? I mean, his presence, uh, uh, that was a part of his gift. And uh, there should be no denying it, but I can't even understand it from, uh, from paintings. Monroe, because he's a family man. And, and I, would, I would also... Uh, like to talk to him, you know, what, what, what has come down is that he was sort of the tailing off of the Virginia dynasty. Yeah. Well, you know, let's talk about that uh, long period of, uh, of achievement and accomplishment. He was insulted when a friend of his said that his mind, Monroe's mind, was neither rapid nor rich, <laughs> meaning it was kind of a, I don't know, not a dunce, but someone who isn't really sharp and with it. The friend went on to say that his habits of persistence and uh, his, his uh, recognition of what you could achieve if you just tried hard enough more than made up for it. But, uh, you know, Monroe was hurt by the earlier part. I I'd like to hear him uh, talk about uh, uh, how he regards himself um, in uh, relationship to the other three dynasts. It's intriguing that you say that because we, we in, in interpreting Monroe, we do encounter a lot of things where there is this sort of assumption that, that you know, because he's coming at the end, that, that there is sort of the, the gas running out in the tank a little bit. And yet, Monroe is a very transitional figure in the presidency, in the national life. He is coming of age and fighting in the revolution. He is moving through this early national period and, and he is there for the Missouri Compromise. And so he's at sort of the intersection from one era of our national history as it is starting to evolve toward another. And uh, I, I think that that having sort of foot in both of those eras yes. makes him an interesting pivotal figure. He also, uh, uh, we like to think is the guy you could always count on being in the room somewhere with, uh, <laughs> with most of these other figures. And in so many rooms, yes. Yeah, there's that's something it. to be said that he was there. He was he 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 had that persistence and and to a good degree was was considered reliable as an ally. I think. Uh, I mean, when you, when you think of Madison, of his having run against Madison twice, um, had uh, resentments toward Madison, and then you look at Madison's appointing him to be, as you earlier noted. Secretary of War and Secretary of State at the same time. It, it shows you that Monroe wore very well. Would you say yeah. weird very well? No, wore very well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I think that uh, you at the museum have done a wonderful job um, in helping him come to life. Um, I know you have papers there, but it's the material culture that struck me. You know, you can actually see uh, a dress that Mrs. Monroe, who was purportedly, reportedly very beautiful. Uh, you can see a beautiful dress she wore and realize how tiny she was. She was a really small woman. Well. And 
Monroe's, uh, what do you have, his inauguration suit? I just remember seeing uh, it. It's the court suit he wore to uh, Napoleon's coronation and, and other diplomatic affairs, yes. Yeah, you know, he was every place, wasn't he? Um, at, uh, and he knew, he knew these people, he saw these people. So he brought a wealth of experience to the job of the presidency and was a very good president. Well, we, we certainly do think so. We try to, to, to get that across and yet, and it look with as unblinking an eye as we can, as, as we must. The Madison and Monroe relationship, I think on a personal level is the one that endured longest. And, and within our collection is a copy of a letter that Monroe wrote from his daughter's house in New York, where he had gone after his wife had died and his son-in-law. And it's very poignant because he's noting it that they they he expects they will never see each other again. It's just a yeah. few weeks before his death, and that relationship of all of them, I think, endured on, on the most uh, positive personal basis uh, of all the four and their interactions. So um, they they ended in a classy way with with each other. Yeah, I, Madison was so patient with everyone who uh, crossed him, um, but you sense real sincerity in the. Uh, uh, the letter that you mentioned that he wrote to Monroe. Well, Dr. Shenny, we really want to thank you for speaking with us um, this evening. Uh, I want to remind the audience um, and you that a recording of the program is going to be archived on the James Monroe Museum's uh, Facebook page and YouTube channel. And there are links to these and many other online resources, educational resources that we have, which you can access at the hands-on history page of the museum's website, which is www.jamesmonroemuseum.umw.edu. And for the James Monroe Museum and for the University of Mary Washington, thank you, uh, Dr. Cheney. Thank you all for watching and we wish everyone a good evening.